Number one. It says a 1,300 kilogram car is moving east at 30 meters per second. And it collides with a 3,200 kilogram truck moving at 20 meters per second direction, 60 degrees north of east. The vehicles interlock, stick together, and move off together. Find their velocity after the collision. Did I just say the word collision, Jacob? Then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go the sum of all the initial momentum equals the sum of all the final momentum. The sum of all the initial momentum equals the sum of all the final momentum. By the way, I sent an email out last night with uh, this year's tutorial, which was only about 25 minutes because people didn't ask many questions. But I also included a link to last year's, which was about an hour and a half long and probably had a lot more questions. So check your emails if you haven't already. Uh, I see a compass mentioned, so I'm going to do my traditional routine. Now I'm going to read this question. Am I going to be able to do this just mathematically by letting to the right be positive and to the left be negative? Or is this one going to involve trig because angles are mentioned? Ah, uh, angles are mentioned. Okay. Before the collision, what's moving? The car, the truck, or both? Both? So I'm going to have this. Momentum of the car initial plus momentum of the truck initial equals... Bam! There's a collision. After the collision, what's moving? The car, the truck, or both? Both stuck together or separate? Stuck together. As a picture, it's going to look like this. Car moving east. How big? Well, its momentum is mass times velocity. I think 39,000. There's a plus sign. Truck moving 60 degrees north of east. There's east. 60 degrees north of east. How big is this arrow? Mass times velocity. 64,000? That equals the final momentum. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. Connor, how do I add two vectors together? Tip to tail. Okay, so we're going to get this. 39,000. 64,000. I think the resultant is that boy right there. I think this is going to be the momentum of both final. And uh, let's see. If this angle is 60 degrees, I think this angle here is 120 degrees. Now I can bring out the famous cosine law. In the interest of time, I'm going to take a little shortcut here. Thanks. Quiz version did I give you? Quiz 2, version 2. Momentum, quiz 2, version 2, answers. Let's bring it up. So I did the cosine law, 39,000 squared plus 64,000 squared, blah, 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 blah. I got a momentum of 90,072 divided by the mass of both to get a speed of 20.0. Then I need to find an angle. The angle is right there. Sine of theta over 64,000 equals sine of 120 over 90,072. Cross multiply, shift sign, 38 degrees north of east. Or you could also have 52 degrees east of north. 
and I gave out the four marks. I gave you one mark if I saw that, one mark if you managed to get the momentum, one mark for the velocity speed, and one mark for the direction to give it a velocity. So, test is photocopied. I think there's one written question like this. Uh, one written question that's an explosion. And then there's one written question that involves both energy and momentum. So there's a straight line collision and a change in height. So like the ballistic pendulum or the roller coaster rolling down the hill and hitting or something like that. Number two. Pendulum is hanging from a frictionless, massless string that is 15 meters long. The pendulum weighs 24 kilograms. A 0 .015, uh, sorry, 2.4 kilograms. A 0 .015 kilogram bullet traveling at 300 meters per second hits the pendulum and it sticks. What height? Well, first of all, there's a collision, momentum. And it's a nice straight one line collision. It's going to be the mass of the bu uh, momentum of the bullet equals the momentum of the bu both of them afterwards. Mass of the bullet, initial velocity of the bullet equals mass both v final. The final velocity is going to be the mass of the bullet times the initial velocity of the bullet divided by the mass of both of them, and I get a velocity of 2.36 meters per second. Then we move to part two, which involves Mitchell energies, because there's a change in height. The amount of kinetic plus the amount of potential initially has to equal the amount of kinetic plus the amount of potential at the end. And wonderfully, at the end, you're stopped, so your kinetic is gone. Oh, and at the beginning, you're on ground level, so your potential initial is zero. A half mv initial squared equals G A M G H final. Yay, masses cancel. You end up with the height equaling vi squared over 2g, and you get a height of 0.284. Bonus, suppose the pendulum only reaches a height of 0.15. How many joules of energy were lost to heat and sound? So I said, okay, I think I'm solving this using energies. I said, now it's going to be kinetic initial plus potential initial equals kinetic final plus potential final plus heat, whatever I've lost. Uh, hey, that's still zero. Hey, that's still zero. Heat's going to be kinetic initial minus potential final, a half mv initial squared minus mgh final, a half mv initial squared minus mgh final, and I got 3.18 joules of heat must have been created. Question, Connor? Which one, mass? Uh, okay. Example three. A one hundred kilogram shell explodes. Boom! Into three fragments. Fragment A weighs 40 kilograms and flies off at 32 meters per second at a direction 30 degrees north of east. Fragment B weighs 25 kilograms and flies off at 48 meters per second in a direction due north. Find the velocity of fragment C. You'll have to use the sine and the cosine law here. I'm going to give you an explosion on your test, but it's going to be a nice right-angled explosion, so you can use Sokotoa. Okay. Get the quiz? Got it? So, in this case, in an explosion, I said, look, my initial momentum was zero, so this has to add to zero. I'm going to have that momentum plus that momentum plus whatever this is equals zero. And when I say equals zero, Sean, in vector math, what I really mean is draw a triangle that comes back to where it started from. This plus this uh, back here. 
Uh, I did cosine law, and I got a momentum of 2148 dividing by the mass, and I was able to go 100 minus 40 minus 25, whatever mass left over is 35. I got a speed of 61.4 meters per second. The really tricky part here is the angle. I'm not going to give you one quite this yucky. But, first of all, I found theta right there, because that's where I'm starting from. Theta, when I use the sine law, ends up being 30 degrees, but that's not a useful angle for me, because unfortunately, for it to be a useful angle, let's go back to my drawing. Theta ends up being 30, but what I really want is this angle here. Oh, but wait a minute. I also knew that if that's 30 and this is 120, this also ends up being 30 degrees because I was able to go angles add to a triangle, and I was able to say, oh, it says Z. This is also 30 degrees. Hey, these two here add to 60 degrees. It wasn't exactly 60. It's almost an isosceles triangle, but quite. It was like 60.4 or something like that. I'm not going to give you one, Caitlin, that yucky for angles. Okay. I'll give you one where it's nice silk toe. But I'd rather have you find the test easier than the quiz. How many of you got the angle there? Okay. Just a couple of you. How many of you got the velocity? Okay, like the 61.4. And number four. And all they asked for was the magnitude of the initial velocity. I said, okay, before the collision, what's moving? Mass one. After, mass one and mass two. Draw a picture. And it did say uh, the initial velocity, was, didn't it say? Yeah, it was due east. So I knew I could draw that. This plus this equals that. This one was a little bit strange. I could actually, because they gave me two angles, I was able to say that's 48, that's 48, that's 38, that's 38. I was able to get all three angles in the triangle, which meant you could have used cosine law. You were fine in using cosine law if you wanted to, but because you have a pair, you could go straight to sine law, which is just cross-multiplying and a bit easier. 11.2. I didn't actually go over these, I just showed you the answers because I kind of felt like people were doing the hang of, getting the hang of this, but I will stop now and say, any of these ones that you're going, I have no idea what you did, Mr. Duet, can you explain the steps better? I'm happy to. Well then, add your scores up out of, count them, 16, not 12. Oh, I thought I was going to get 15 out of 12. No. Out of 16. So the next unit, unit five, circular motion. And I need you to be quiet, please. We're going to start with a question. The question we're going to ask ourselves is this. Is it possible for an object to have a constant speed and yet still be accelerating? Yes or no and convince me. Can you have a constant speed and still be accelerating? Who says, oh, Connor, can you use calculus? Absolutely. Sorry? Uh, derivative of uh, speed is accelerate, der derivative of velocity is acceleration. So you guys, have, uh, by the way, nerdy aside, who's in calc? Okay, so what's the derivative of distance? Velocity, you learn, yes? And what's the derivative of velocity? Acceleration. What's the derivative of acceleration? Have you learned that yet? Brett, a jerk, which makes sense. The rate of change of acceleration is how hard you yank something. Oh, it's called a jerk. What's the derivative of a jerk? 
So, calculus students. Calculus students, look up for a second. If you have a distance function x, you've learned that x prime is velocity. Quiet, please. X double prime is acceleration. Do you guys know what the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth derivatives of distance are called? Physicists have a sense of humor. That's not completely official. That's It may become official, but it's sort of what they're called. Answering your question, sure, Connor, yeah, but I don't think you need to. Can you have a constant speed and yet still be accelerating? I'm going to tell you the answer is yes. And now I'm going to say, okay, if I've told you the answer is yes, can you think of a way that you can be having a constant speed and yet still be accelerating? John, then you wouldn't be at a constant speed. Brett, Brett, what? You can, because velocity is made up of two things. It's a vector, it has magnitude, but what else does it have? Direction, so if the magnitude's not changing, what can be changing? The direction, and acceleration, Nicole, was defined as a change in velocity. We never said what that change was. In physics 11, it was always a change in magnitude. However, in physics 12, we're saying, oh, you know what? You can, yeah. Change in direction. Let me give you a great example right now. I would argue as I'm spinning this around my head, it's traveling at a pretty constant speed. Each time it goes around, it's taking about the same time. I'm pretty close. But I can tell you it's accelerating. You know why? I feel a force on my hand, and I know it has mass, and force is mass times what? Force is mass times what? Acceleration. If there wasn't acceleration, I wouldn't be feeling a force. Right? In fact, any time you're traveling in a circle, you are accelerating. What we're going to look at in circular motion is constant speed circles, not changing speed circles. And so we're rarely, Brandon, going to look at this one. Because this one, you travel faster when you're going down and slower when you're traveling up. We're not going to look at vertical circles very often, uh, unless it's a static circle, a fixed circle like a Ferris wheel. That we can look at, because that one doesn't speed up and slow down, because it's, it's not a string. But absolutely, you can be traveling in a constant speed and have a changing direction, therefore you have an acceleration. In fact, Brett, did you figure that out or did you read ahead here and look at this? Because it says right here, for an object moving at a constant speed in a circle, what we call, fancy word, uniform circular motion, its velocity is changing because its direction is changing. And if the velocity is changing, the object must be accelerating because acceleration was defined as a change in velocity. And we never said what was changing. We just said that something had to be changing. This is the most important fact to keep in mind about circular motion. If you are moving in a circle, you're accelerating. Oh, and if you have a mass, it means you the force. The question is, what direction? Well, to find the direction of the acceleration, we have to do some vector subtraction. We know this, VF equals VI plus AT. Yes? Which gives A equals VF minus VI all over T. Now, Brett, T is a scalar. But these two are vectors. This is where the vector direction for acceleration comes from. This minus this. How do I subtract two vectors together? It's a trick question. How do I subtract two vectors together? I don't. What do I do instead, Trevor? I add the opposite. Uh, technical comment. We're also soon, soon going to show that our acceleration is not constant because the acceleration is also changing direction. Uh, that's okay. We can find the direction by going this minus this because dividing by time won't change its direction. So here is my time-lapse photography picture. We're moving in a circle. 
and at one point right here I was traveling this way and then a split second later I was traveling this way. Let's subtract these two vectors. So it's going to be V final minus V initial. That's going to be the same as V final plus negative V initial. Here's V final. Now, V initial was this way. Negative V initial would be like that. And we get our direction for acceleration. Mitsu, if you're moving in a circle, you know what direction you're accelerating? Towards the center. See it? In fact, if I'd really done this with like a computer software program, A would be pointing directly dead center. If you're moving in a circle, Katie, you're accelerating towards the middle. And that's very, very counterintuitive for us. That bugs us because most of us think when we're moving in a circle, whether we're on a merry-go-round at a playground or in a car that's turning a corner or on the scrambler or music express rides at Playland, we think we're accelerating outwards. We're not. When you're moving in a circle, you're accelerating inwards. Example three. A ball on a frictionless tabletop is rolled along a circular tra track as seen below top view. The track is not a complete circle, it's had a chunk cut out of it. So the ball rolls this far and then when it gets to here, it leaves the track. Which path does the ball follow after leaving the track, A or B or C? A, path A, due to the fact that the ball has circular momentum, which keeps it moving in a circular path for a while after it leaves the track. Path B, since there is no force from the track, so the ball should go in a straight line. Or path C, since when the track is no longer applying a force on the ball, the ball will fly outwards. <laughs> once again, we're going to vote once again how high you hold your hand is, how sure you are of the answer. Who says path A? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. <laughs> Who says path B? One, two, three, four. Who says path C? All right, convince me that you're right or that someone else is wrong. Let's replace the track with a string. Yes. Okay. If I cut the string, so let's freeze frame it. Imagine we freeze frame it with this right here. And I were to cut the string. Would these keep going in a circle around my head? No, Katie, which way would they travel? They'd hit Brandon, square in the head. Or if I uh, cut the string when it was right here, Mitsu, they'd hit you in the head. Or Emily. They don't want to keep going in a circle. You have to apply a force to move them in a circle. So if these wouldn't keep going in a circle when I cut a string, does that help you revise your answer, what you think might be the correct answer for this track, A or B or C. And those of you that voted A is a very common misconception. First of all, here's the ball right here. Top view, what are the forces on it? Get the obvious ones. Gravity would be going into the page. There would be a normal force out of the page. 
Those would cancel each other out. Is there friction? Okay. Are there any other forces acting on it? Emily, if there's no other forces acting on it, how can it change direction? How can it accelerate? It would have to keep going Newton's first in a straight line at a constant speed. B. B. The problem is this. The problem is most of you, your experience with circular motion is going around a corner quickly in a car. So why is it that the acceleration is inwards when the push that we experience in the car seems to be outwards? And the answer is the push is actually an inertial effect. It's your mass. When we are turning in the car, the friction with the road turns the car. And the friction with the seat turns our lower body, but our head, which initially has no forces acting on it, wants to keep going in a nice straight line. And you have to then exert a force using your neck on your upper torso and head to get it to move to the center. But you don't realize that you think you're getting pushed outwards and you're creating a force reacting to that push outwards, you think. You're not. You want to keep going in a straight line and the car is moving out from underneath you. So you've got to push inwards to match the car, which is moving inwards. Does that make sense? Not the way we feel it, but that's what's going on. Also, you may remember I've said to you a few times, our bodies are backwards accelerometers. If you're ever on a ride or in a car, whatever way you feel like you're being pushed, I guarantee you the acceleration is in the opposite direction. How many have been on the elevator before? Okay. When it launches you upwards, which way does your stomach feel like it's going? Downwards. But which way are you clearly accelerating? Upwards. When it goes downwards, which way do you feel like you're going to fly? Upwards, in fact, you're, but you're clearly accelerating downwards. Our bodies are backwards accelerometers. When you're in a car and you come to a stop, which way do you feel like you're getting pushed when you come to a stop? Forwards, but which way are you clearly accelerating when you come to a stop? You gotta be accelerating backwards, right? So when in doubt, go with the opposite of which way you feel. That comes in handy when we go to Playland in a couple of months. So from the point of view of the driver inside the car, this straight line motion seems to be outwards towards the passenger side door. In fact, I think I told a number of you back in the 1950s, ask your grandparents about the, ask your grandfather about this. Uh, back when they had bench seats and no seat belts. If you were going on a date with your lady, what you would do is you would take surfer's wax and you would wax the passenger seat. And then you would sit like this and you would take a very quick right corner and she would come sliding across the seat into your arm and you would, oh, hi, honey, how are you doing? Now, that's not what was happening. In actual fact, she was continuing going in a nice straight line and you were turning the car underneath her. But because your frame of reference was the car, you didn't realize that. Ask your grandparents. I've had, I've said this, told this story a few times now, and almost every year I've had someone come back, and my grandfather actually admitted to doing that. Okay. The reason this is important is because of bad physics. It's because of at least 16 of you. Here is the bad physics. This discussion is important because many years of experience in a car lead most students to believe that there is an outwards force. In fact, people even gave it a name. They talk about centrifugal force with an F, centrifugal force. And centrifugal force is not a force at all. It's inertia, which refers to this apparent outwards push. There's even machines called centrifuges, which use this force. It's not a force. It's inertia. I hope you'll agree with me, Brandon. A bird's eye view confirms that the outwards push is not outwards, but actually in a straight line and not a force. It's just your mass wanting to keep going. It's Newton's first law. Your mass wants to keep going in a straight line at a steady speed. Furthermore, our vector analysis done previously shows us that the acceleration and therefore the force are actually inwards. When you're moving in a circle, your net force is towards the center. You can take that to the bank every time. How many of you have gone on a little playground merry-go-round? Okay. Which way do you feel like you're about to get pushed when the merry-go-round goes fast? 
I've just told you your bodies are backwards accelerometers. Which way are you actually accelerating them? In inwards. And in fact, it's your mass wanting to keep going in a straight line. When you lean out and hold the bar, you're actually having to exert the force inwards because you're having to pull with your arms to keep yourself from flying off into space. And it's not that there's a force pushing you out. It's you're having to create the force to push you inwards. Example four. If fighter pilots move too fast into a loop, they can become unconscious due to a lack of blood flow to the brain. Sometimes this is called centrifugal force. They say that the blood has rushed to their feet. That is not correct. So here's your loop. Here's your pilot sitting. Okay. There's my stick figure diagram. It's about as good as you're going to get, Brett. Live with it. Which way does his blood want to keep going? What does Newton's first law say? His blood wants to keep going in a nice straight, what? Nice straight line. The plane applies a force in this direction, but his blood wants to keep going in a nice straight line. And because it's liquid, it can somewhat keep going in a nice straight line so that when he gets to here, Even though we say the blood has pooled in his legs, what's really happened is the blood has stayed where it wants to. His body has moved up away from his blood. If I'm really going to be technical, his brain has moved away from his blood, and that's why he's blacking out. In World War II, and I need to double-check this. I've tried to double-check the story. My physics prof told me this. In World War II, in the Battle of Britain, there was a pilot who crashed, and he lost both of his legs below the knee. But there was such a shortage of pilots and because he was healthy otherwise, and they were desperate, they rigged up a plane, they put longer pedals on it, because he was still able to fly, his hands were fine, and he would go, and he would fly. And what he would do is he would get the German pilots to fly, fly, uh, come right behind him. He would dive down and pull up sharply. But because he had no legs, more of the blood would stay in his brick. Sorry. Because he had no legs, there was less room for the blood to keep going in a straight line. More of it would stay in his brain. And so, of course, pilots all having a huge ego, the German pilot would say, well, he can do it. I can follow him because there's no reason why he, I would black out if he didn't black out. And the pilots would follow him into the dive. He would pull up. They would black out and they would crash. And in fact, it reached the point where the pilots had memorized what his plane looked like and what his number was, and they would radio each other, don't follow him into that dive. We don't know what's going on here, but he can do something we can't. It's why fighter pilots can't be tall. In fact, you know who makes the best fighter pilots? Females. Because females, on average, are shorter. It's why fighter pilots also, though, wear those G suits. If you ever watch a pilot when they're taking huge Gs, when they're doing a loop, what they're doing is they're tightening every muscle in their abdomen and in their legs because by tightening the muscles, you're constricting the blood vessels. They're trying to push or prevent the blood from pooling in their legs. Okay? The shorter you are, the easier it is. And the, the fighter pilots have suits that are designed when the G-forces increase. They actually have inflatable cuffs like a tourniquet that inflates and cuts off the blood flow to your lower body, forcing the blood to stay up here. There's a reason, if you ever see fighter pilots either on TV or in an interview, none of them are in bad shape. You can't be fat and out of shape because if you're fat and out of shape, there's too much room for the blood to go down here and you'll black out. So how can we calculate circular acceleration? To be honest, the proof is a bit long. I'm just going to give it to you. What letter do we use for acceleration? To show that it's centripetal or circular acceleration, I put a little subscripted C. Oh, and it's not a vector equation, it's a scalar equation. I know the direction. You know what the direction is? Towards the center. And it's equal to your circular velocity squared divided by the radius. V squared over R. But I want to distinguish that V to say, oh, it's... It's the speed, Connor, that I'm traveling in this circle, however fast I'm going. Okay. K 
Kara, the next logical question is, okay, Mr. Duke, I'm pretty sure I know what R is, radius. How do I find circular velocity? Well, velocity is distance over time. If we're going at a constant velocity, and we did say we're going at a constant velocity because we said our acceleration is due to the inwards motion, but we're not changing the velocity. What's the distance around a circle? Math 12, who did radians yesterday, may remember. What's the equation for the distance around a circle? The circumference. Okay. Circular velocity is 2 pi r. And we have a symbol. If you go once around, the time that it takes you to go once around is capital T. It's called the period. Does somebody have a formula sheet handy in front of them? Brett, you do? Is this on the formula sheet? Can you look for me under circular motion and gravitation? No, no, no. Is VC is velocity on the formula sheet? No. This you need to know. But I just showed you how you can derive it. Okay. This is on the formula sheet. V squared over R. And yes, I know there's another expression that we're going to look at in a second. Where the speed here is the circular speed. Hey, um, what if I plug this into there? I get this. That's V squared over R still. I'm not going to bore you with the algebra. Well, some of this we can get. What's 2 squared? What's 2 squared? What's pi squared? Just plain old pi squared. What's r squared? Well, how many r's are on top? 2. How many r's are on the bottom? 1. You're going to have 1 r left behind and a t on the bottom. This is your second equation for circular acceleration. There are two equations, Kara. v squared over r or 2 pi squared r over t squared. Which one do we use, Mr. Duick? I use this one if I know how fast we're traveling. I use this one if I know how long it took to go around once. Yep. Yes, thank you. Kara, fix that. t squared. Good gosh. 4 pi squared r over t squared. These are the two equations that are on your formula sheet. Now, we've got a bit of a problem. What letter is that right there, Matt? What letter is that right there? If I wanted to turn an acceleration into a force, what do I have to multiply an A by to turn an acceleration into a force? Mass. You know what the most common mistake is? Because these equations are so complicated, kids have F equals 4 pi squared R over... No, that's F equals A. What have they forgotten? They've forgotten to put an M in front of it. So that's one thing we'll talk about, and I'll yell at you. That's one of the common mistakes. Kids think, this is a force. No, it's acceleration. To change it into a force, better put an M in front of it. By the way, a concept closely related to period is the frequency. We define the frequency as the number of cycles per second. The unit cycle per second is also known as 1 hertz. For what it's worth, period is how many seconds to go around once. Frequency is to go around once and how many seconds. They're reciprocals of each other. Period is 1 over the frequency. Frequency is 1 over the period. Example 6. An object is moving at 4 meters per second in uniform circular motion. Can you all right now underline the phrase uniform circular motion? It accelerates at 2 meters per second squared for 3 seconds. Find A, the final speed, D, the distance traveled.
A. V final is 4.0 meters per second. No, Mr. Duick, that's V initial. No, it's V final. But Mr. Duick, there's an acceleration. What direction is the acceleration if we're moving in a circle toward the center? What did we say uniform circular motion meant? Stay on this page. We defined uniform circular motion as So there was an acceleration, but Brianna, that was to throw you, well, no, it wasn't to throw you off. It was to tell you that you're moving in a circle and you're accelerating towards the center. But your speed is not changing. Your speed is not changing. You'll notice I left the vector off. The direction is changing. In fact, you know what your direction, your speed is always? It's always perpendicular to the radius. Your speed right now is that way. Your speed right there is that way. Your speed right there is that way. Your speed right there is that way. It's always traveling. Oh, I can use a Math 11 word, tangent to the radius. Remember your tangent lines and all that from Math 11? B asks for the distance traveled. D equals VT. Mr. Duke, what about plus a half AT squared? The A is towards the center. It's not in the same direction as the speed. I cannot use them in the same expression. The distance traveled is going to be 4 times 3. It's going to have traveled exactly 12 meters in a circle. I'm looking at this here, and I think I meant to put it in this box here. It says, since AC equals V squared over R and BC equals 2 pi R over T, we can substitute VC into A, and we get AC equals 4 pi squared R over T squared, where T is the period. That's the time to go once around, and R is the radius. It's okay to write it twice. technical comment in uniform circular motion we have a strange situation the object is moving at a constant speed but it's also accelerating because its direction is changing the acceleration direction is changing all the time right now the acceleration is kind of down and left right now the acceleration is up and left it's always towards the center but because you're moving around the circle the direction towards the center is changing all the time this means, unfortunately, we can't use these anymore. We have to use circular acceleration and circular velocity, speed. What's your homework? You're going to find in this unit, you're going to be using the data sheet an awful lot, finally. So on your formula sheet, the back page has all sorts of data. You want to look at it. It has the mass of the Earth, the radius of the Earth, the radius of the sun's orbit, the radius of the sun, the radius of the moon's orbit, the radius of the moon, all the stuff that we need to do that. Oh, it has the period of the Earth's. Oh, what is the period for the Earth to go around once? How long does it take the Earth to revolve around itself once? You all know this. 24 hours. You can convert that to seconds. What's the period to go around the sun well, it's 365 days, but it's not quite exact. I think they actually give you the period in seconds on your sheet, and that includes the quarter of the day leap year thingy that doesn't work out. Okay? Find the, for number one, on the Earth, on the equator, the frequency, the speed you're traveling on the equator, and the inwards acceleration required for that to occur. Same for the moon. Same for the sun. Number four says, examine how the spin cycle on a washing machine works to partially dry clothes. 
And part of this question got chopped off, Mr. Duick. It was supposed to ask which way does the water move. If you actually look at the spin cycle, the water does not move this way. If you look at it very closely, the water is always moving 90 degrees to the radius because that's which direction your speed is. Sorry, I guess I'm going to have to nuke number four because I didn't somehow copy it properly. Five is good. Seven is good. Eight, nine. We're going to pause there.